Hello fellow teachers, this is Teaching with Power, and in this video I'd like to give you a meaningful way to teach the crucifixion of the Savior. Even though this is a difficult and painful thing to contemplate, the Savior teaches some valuable lessons even in the midst of his suffering. Now as you watch, if you feel this video is helping you in any way, I encourage you to hit the subscribe button down below, which will cause the channel to grow and help other teachers just like you. This is insight number two for the week of June 17th to June 23rd in the Come Follow Me manual, and I usually make about two to three videos per week. A caution about teaching the crucifixion. Please don't spend too much time going over all the gruesome details of how crucifixion worked. I've been in too many classes where the teacher spent over 10 minutes going into a clinical graphic description of how terrible and agonizing crucifixion would have been. I think it's important to understand that it was painful and extremely difficult to bear, but your students don't need their faces rubbed in it either. There's a tendency to want to emphasize the horrors of the crucifixion to draw a response from your students. But I feel that that can come across as a little emotionally manipulative and distracting from the beautiful, uplifting nature of the sacrifice that Jesus made. I understand that this may be more of a personal preference, but I urge you to consider this caution as you prepare your lesson. All right, with that out of the way, the icebreaker is a little more serious in nature. It's often a good idea to begin a lesson with something relevant to the lives of your students. The earlier you establish the relevancy of the scriptures in their minds, the more engaged they're going to be. You need to give them a reason to listen and to care about what the scriptures say. So ask, think about one of the trials you faced or are facing in your life. What is something that has helped you to endure or get through your suffering? Make sure that you give them some time to ponder your question before you jump in. However, be prepared to share something of your own as well. Then transition to the scriptures with, Crucifixion is certainly one of the cruelest forms of execution ever devised. Even though none of us will really ever have a Gethsemane, the only person to have a Gethsemane was Jesus, we do have crosses to bear. Even Jesus told us to take up our cross and follow him. Thankfully, our crosses don't look like his, but we do have them, and in a way, they can almost be just as torturous and hard to bear as was his. What should we do when they come? Jesus will teach us by example. While Christ hung on the cross, he made seven statements. Each holds a key to understanding the Christ-like way of enduring suffering. Then send them into the scriptures to find them. You can make a chart on a whiteboard or on a screen or a piece of paper with the following references and have them randomly select one or two of them to identify the statements that Christ made. Fill them in as they're identified. And here they are. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It is finished. And each statement is a sermon. Each one offers immense enlightenment and instruction. So take each statement one at a time, and for each ask, what does this teach you about enduring hardship and suffering? And that's basically all the lesson plan you need. That approach should carry you right through to the conclusion. But I'd love to offer you some insights as a teacher that you may find useful as you respond to their comments and perhaps add some of your own. So statement number one, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus understood the power of forgiveness. When God asks us to forgive others, I don't believe that it's necessarily just for their benefit but for ours. The sooner we let go of that resentment, the hate, the desire for revenge, the quicker we can begin to heal. Jesus understood this principle so well that he forgives almost immediately. It's one thing to forgive somebody after they've hurt you, but it's completely another to forgive them while they're hurting you. If you want to get through your suffering easier, forgive. And that doesn't mean that you allow them to keep hurting you, and it's not saying that what they did was okay. It's not even letting them off the hook. It's just letting them off your hook. A scripture comes to mind from Doctrine and Covenants 64, 10 through 11. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive. But of you it is required to forgive all men. And ye ought to say in your hearts, Let God judge between me and thee, and reward thee according to thy deeds. So let God be the judge. It's not our job. We put it into his hands and let him judge. And by the way, I also believe and acknowledge that there are some offenses committed against us that are so severe and devastating that forgiveness may take some time. And I think our Heavenly Father understands that. But we should be working towards it. 
So the truth that's taught here, forgiving those that have hurt me can help me endure my suffering. Statements 2 and 3. Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. I lump these two together because I feel the message in these two are much the same. It's also a message I talked about in last week's video, The Two Loves of the Last Supper. And I'll put a link to that video in the upper right-hand corner here, and also in the description below. But in that video, I made the point that of all the people in the world who needed comfort and reassurance at this time, it was Jesus. But who was doing the comforting? He was. He who needed comfort was the comforter. He who needed support is doing the supporting. He who needed reassurance is doing the reassuring. In times of suffering, it's very natural for us to turn inward, to focus on our problems and our needs. But Jesus turned outward and focuses on the needs and concerns of those around him. And there are so many examples of this in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. All throughout the Last Supper and to the garden, he comforts his apostles and tells them to be of good cheer. He heals the ear of the officer whose ear Peter cuts off. Even to Pilate, he says, They who delivered me unto thee have the greater sin. And here, to the thief beside him who shows a measure of faith in Christ's divinity and innocence, he gives reassurance of better things to come in the next life. And for his beloved mother, a charge to John to guarantee her care and livelihood after his death. Outward, always outward. He couldn't help it. He spent his life reaching out to bless and succor others, and not even the torture of the cross could drive that out of him. So, as I said in the Two Loves of the Last Supper video, to alleviate my own suffering, I can seek to alleviate the suffering of others. Statement number four. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And I have two thoughts on this one. One, this withdrawal of the Spirit was a necessary part of the experience of the atonement. Jeffrey R. Holland's quote is probably the most eloquent and effective way of explaining this truth. With all the conviction of my soul, I testify that he did please his father perfectly, and that a perfect father did not forsake his son in that hour. Indeed, it is my personal belief that in all of Christ's mortal ministry, the father may never have been closer to his son than in these agonizing final moments of suffering. Nevertheless, that the supreme sacrifice of his son might be as complete as it was voluntary and solitary, the Father briefly withdrew from Jesus the comfort of his spirit, the support of his personal presence. It was required. Indeed, it was central to the significance of the atonement. That this perfect Son, who had never spoken ill, nor done wrong, nor touched an unclean thing, had to know how the rest of humankind, us, all of us, would feel when we did commit such sins. For his atonement to be infinite and eternal, he had to feel what it was like to die not only physically, but spiritually, to sense what it was like to have the divine spirit withdraw, leaving one feeling totally, abjectly, hopelessly alone. I can't say it any better than that, and I feel that teaches us a powerful principle as well. Suffering is harder when we don't have the spirit. So when you suffer, make sure you're doing everything in your power to keep him near. In times of distress, you need his presence more than ever. One of his titles is the comforter, so let him comfort you. How do you keep the Spirit? Well, there's a lot you could say in response to that, but keeping it simple, primary answers are remarkably effective and true. Pray, study the scriptures, attend your church meetings, go to the temple. Strive to remain worthy in every way you can. Second, in the Gospels, we experience the crucifixion from the perspective of the outside looking up, from the third person. But would you be interested in understanding the crucifixion from the inside, looking down, to see it from the first person? Well, you can. When Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He may have been quoting a favorite psalm, drawing strength from a sacred hymn that he must have been familiar with. So if you want that first person perspective, read Psalm 22. I won't go through it verse by verse with you, but I invite you to read that psalm carefully and prayerfully. It'll give you a unique outlook on the Savior's experience you'll see that the psalm begins with a remarkably accurate description of his suffering, written hundreds of years before it happened. But it ends in triumph. By the time he's finished, he is glorifying the Father and his goodness. So in this light, this may not be a cry of despair or anguish, but a reminder of God's goodness and power even in the midst of our deepest suffering. The lesson that I see in that, drawing strength from the scriptures and sacred music can help me endure my suffering.
Statement number five, the one request that Christ makes for himself, I thirst. He's thirsty, a very common request of a dying person. I won't go into a lot of detail on this one because I feel I covered the significance of that statement in the Easter video I did on the atonement. I'll give you a link here at the top of the screen and also a link in the description below and invite you to go back and watch that video to get my thoughts on the beauty of this statement. But in short, Jesus refers to his atonement as a bitter cup. It was like drinking a cup of something very bitter. And he drank that cup from Gethsemane to Golgotha. And so in this last moment where he says he thirsts, what did they give him? Vinegar. And how fitting that the last taste on the Savior's lips before he dies is bitterness. He drank that cup to its last bitter drop. But if there is a truth about suffering that this statement teaches, perhaps it's this. Requesting help from others can help me to endure my suffering. Statement number six. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. What stands out to me in this statement is the phrase, into thy hands. What Jesus is doing is placing his spirit, sacrifice, and suffering into the hands of his Father in heaven. What a beautiful thought. Could we do the same? Place all of it into the hands of our Heavenly Father? I'm certain that when we do that, just like the Father did for his Son, he will make something positive out of all our negatives. I like to imagine somebody coming to God and just pouring out a description of all the negatives in their life. And God saying, put them into my hands and see what I can do. And he'll take each one and say, through the power of the atonement and the cross, I will cross your negatives and turn them all into positives. Joseph Smith taught us that all your losses will be made up to you in the resurrection, provided you continue faithful. By the vision of the Almighty, I have seen it. And you may have seen some examples of this already in your life. Some past challenge, trial, or difficulty. With the amazing perspective of hindsight, you see that some good has come from it. Even though for some trials we may say, no future blessing could ever make up for this. I'm certain that someday we will be grateful for our past sorrows and sufferings. Remember what Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good to them that love God. And that all things includes our sufferings. So, the truth, if I place my sufferings in God's hands, he will turn it to my good. Statement number seven, it is finished. Perhaps my favorite statement of all. What does that statement mean for you and me? It means that if Jesus, who suffered more than any mortal has ever suffered, could say that of his pains and sorrows, then you will too. There will come a day when you will get to say that. It is finished. I don't have to endure this anymore. That pain is gone. That problem is over. I have endured to the end. The promise is in the phrase itself. Endure to the end means that there will in fact be an end. It's not endure this throughout eternity. It's endure to the end. In the great it is finished was given the power to grant all of us an it is finished. I promise you that one day you too will speak those liberating three words. The burdens will be lifted chains loosened, and the wounds healed. Perhaps one of my favorite scripture verses of all time is found in Revelation 21.4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So the truth that this teaches, remembering that there will be an end to all pain, can help me endure my suffering. Like I said, every statement is a sermon in and of itself. The challenge will be deciding where to spend the time you're given to teach them. And overall, one final thought. The very fact that Jesus is suffering so profoundly in this instance teaches a truth in and of itself. I've been asked by students in the past the following question. If resurrection takes away all our imperfections, wounds, and scars, then why does Jesus still have the marks of the cross on his hands, feet, and side? And my answer to this is that after the resurrection, those scars became more than just scars. They became signs, symbols, and tokens of his sacrifice. A message to the world to all those who have been and will be witnesses of his resurrection. What is that message? Well, once again, I turn to Elder Holland, who said, In a resurrected, otherwise perfected body, our Lord of this sacrament table has chosen to retain, for the benefit of his disciples, the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side. Signs, if you will, that painful things happen even to the pure and the perfect. And in another place, 
The wounds in his hands, feet, and side are signs that in mortality painful things happen even to the pure and the perfect. Signs that tribulation is not evidence that God does not love us. It is a significant and hopeful fact that it is the wounded Christ who comes to our rescue. He who bears the scars of sacrifice, the lesions of love, the emblems of humility and forgiveness, is the captain of our soul. That evidence of pain and mortality is undoubtedly intended to give courage to others who are also hurt and wounded by life, perhaps even in the house of their friends. So when we suffer, it's very natural and easy to come to one of four conclusions. One, God is not there. Or two, God's there, but he's not listening. Or three, God's there, he's listening, but he doesn't care. Or four, God's there, he's listening, he cares, but I'm not worthy of his help. I bear witness to you that when you suffer, all four of these conclusions are false. God is there. He is listening. He does care. And there is nothing that you could ever do that would make you unworthy of his love and care if you turn to him. I know that as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we get a little uneasy about images of the Savior on the cross. We don't put crosses on our churches. We don't wear it on our jewelry. We don't venerate it as a symbol of our religion, as most Christian faiths do. But I hope this study has given you a clearer picture of the meaning of the cross to us. As always, we look to the miracles of Gethsemane and the garden tomb over what happened on Golgotha. And I feel it is appropriate that we emphasize Christ's victory over death over that death itself. But we too should honor the cross and recognize what happened there as a fundamental and powerful part of the great story of Christ's atonement. And as for a conclusion to your lesson, I'd suggest you bear your sincere testimony of how Christ's experience on the cross has blessed you. Well, I hope this has helped you. And if it has, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. I hope that you can take something from here, make it your own, and teach it with power. Thank you for watching.